Well, here I am on a very windswept West Somerset beach. It's a steep shingle beach. I've tried to, you know, arrange to get here at low tide. It's strewn with boulders, snag city, but they do get some good fish running around here. I'm probably not going to get the chance with this wind howling and it's picking up all the time to use the uh, camera mic because I'm fishing on my own yet again. The surf starting to pound in down there. I've got crab baits out. I've also got some small hooks just with squid strip just to see what's out there. I fear the worst as far as losing tackle is, but I've got to give it a shot here first. If it's no good, I'll move to another beach. I might even go and hit a pier, I don't know. I've driven all the way here, and basically, <laughs> it's a lot rougher than we thought it would be. That's right. It seems, somehow it seems much warmer in the car park. The wind doesn't seem so strong, especially when you're sitting inside the car. When you start marching about one and a half miles, and then you have to go across all these boulders, it does get a trifle trying. But I'm here, gonna give it a shot, probably give it, well, until I lose gear and or three hours, because as I get pushed further up this beach, as you can see behind me here, I'm not gonna reach the sand, which I'm hoping I'm on at the moment with my first cast. There's a brown demarcation line there, about 30, 40 yards out from the base of the rocks, and I'm assuming that that's a turnover point for the sand there. So I'm hoping we're on the sand. Once the tide turns, it pushes me further back, and with this wind coming in, it's gonna kill my cast. There's no 100 yard cast, it's gonna be 70s, especially if I've got big base like crab. Give it a shot, hey ho, that's what fishing is all about. I'll take this away in your seat. Whoa, take the umbrella away. And this is my wind muff. Ooh, a lovely colour. We're not going to move this camera a second, guys. Save the blank. It's howling, as you can no doubt hear with the mic. But, turn that guy around, I can see what the hell I'm doing. There we go, really nice rockling. I didn't have any target species, so I just wanted to come fishing. And that one is, look, if you can just see on the top there, one, two, three. So I'm calling that one as, yes, a three-bearded rockling. Generally, when I go rock, well, I don't go rockling fishing. I think anybody does to be honest, it can't be a rockling club or anything. When you generally catch these, I find personally it's never a good sign because they're quite a sort of slow feeder skulking along the bottom and if they can find the bait that means nothing else can. But hey ho look, that's a pretty little fish there guys, that's quite a pretty fish, he's holding his fins up for us. There's the three whiskers, I believe that's a first on the Totally Awesome Fishing Show, a nice big Three bearded rock beat. Let's get it back, but I'm getting pushed back by the tide all the time. And like most young men, I get easily bored. And if the fish aren't biting, I think about the velocity in slow motion of a stone exploding on another stone. 
Look at the speed that these go in at. And look at the ricochet and bounce. And these boulders weigh about three to five pounds each. Yippee! That's what I call boys fun. Oh, hang on. Something different now. Well, let's try. Well, why not try a whole handful and see how they bounce and explode off all the other stones. I mean, how childish can you get? Well, even more childish, actually. You can see how they ricochet off to the side. What fun is that? And I can even try and break my fishing rod as well. Watch this one. Ooh, ooh boy, that one was close. But safety was at hand in the far dim and distant, well, about half a mile away, was fishing guide Craig Butler from West Coast Tackle. And Craig, as you can see, is a long, long way from me. We were supposed to meet there, but obviously one of us has made a mistake. I feel it's not Craig. It's got to be me. Yes, I'm fishing in the wrong spot. about as much as I can do to stand up now. There's a mass of white water there. Uh, Craig, who's a professional uh, shore fishing guy down here, has turned up. He's just given me a call. He's about probably 400 yards down the beach from me. He thinks it's a real no-go. And where I am is it full of snags, apparently, and I've only just got my gear back. We think we're going to have to go up there to get out the wind, drive around three or four miles around the coast. So, there you go. At the moment, one rockling is all I've got to show. Woo! A blasting wind! Right, we've come right around the other side of the bay. I've joined Craig now, he met up with me and he's asked me, he thinks the best thing I can do is to move because I'm not going to catch any fish around there. Now Craig is a professional guide, now there's a reason behind that. I would quite happily have stayed there, but he does tell me I'm going to be losing gear. So. Craig, give us a few tips in this blustery day that's blasting us as to why exactly you did move around here. There's a couple of reasons why, why I just chose to move. Uh, one, uh, the wind was blowing straight in, straight in on shore there. Good okay to stir the bottom up and put a bit of colour in, but the distance, casting distance, would be seriously cut in half, um, casting into the strong headwind. Uh, plus I noticed there was a hell of a lot of weed floating around the top and with the, on, with the flooding tide on the spring tide it had moon, soon made the conditions more or less impossible to fish and seriously uncomfortable. Uh, so the decision was made to move across the other side of the bay where the wind would be coming off our, off our, right, our left shoulder but you can hear probably this is squally a bit here. I noticed you were using the four ounce uh, grip leads Graham in, that, in the wind. Uh, probably a better idea to step it up to sort of five even six uh, just to, to punch through the wind. Uh, the, the sort of the power of a, a four ounce into the wind is just not going to go far enough so probably better to change up to a, a, a five to six ounce uh, that's the like the yellow the yellow or red color because they're sort of branded sort of five is a yellow and, and six is a, is a red they sort of color code it um, but definitely a way to go there fish a pulley rig you can see we're fishing over a stony beach and there's a bit of a ledge there which you want to get your fish up over um, but yes yeah, strong tackle really to pull it up now, one of the things um, that I know, having used a lot of guides abroad before especially, you need that local information. Now, the first thing I did was go up and over that beach, and then Craig came down and told me it was the snaggiest place on the beach. Well, I think Craig's going to get blown away with the umbrella in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Just as well we moved, Craig, to be honest. Uh, but the main thing is, with a guide, you know when to move, what state are tied, but the other thing, you think, well, oh, I don't really want to pay for a guy. Well, hang on, hang on, people. If you're down here and you've got a boulder screw and beach, you've got no way of knowing, unless you take the trouble to come all the way down just to look at it at low tide, A, is it any good for fishing? And B, where's the demarcation line between boulders, i.e. the snags, and the sand? So, now, if you have a guide, I've worked it out with those leads, those big red caps and, and the expensive leads, what are you going to cost about one pound fifty each? Let's see. See, you go out and you lose. I don't know five sets. I watched a guy down the beach once one night lose at least ten sets in a row. That's extortionate. Craig can actually save you money with the price of a guy because he will tell you where to cast and also you know your distance, where there's sand, where there's snags. I mean, look, you, nothing's guaranteed in fish. We all know that. 
but you can actually chip away at the cost of hiring a guide and work out how much terminal gear you would use, hooks, swivels, beads, leads, could actually be worth your while. I'm a level two uh, sea angling coach, uh, Angling Trust endorsed, first for sports, and I've just started a, a business to, to incorporate the coaching and the guiding all into one. Uh, one to help sort of promote angling and, and bring on younger children in the schools, um, but also to help other people who want to, to better their skills and, and get to know marks, you know, local marks they've, they've heard lots about, but are afraid to go there because they've heard it's snaggy and it's horrible. But these, these marks do have clear patches and those are generally the places which, which you want to aim to fish. The, the base for the guiding services is in Minehead uh, in Somerset, uh, down here on the Bristol Channel. And uh, I've put a boundary really for my, uh, for my guiding services from Hinkley Point uh, up in North Somerset down to near the North Devon coast uh, at Porlock Weir. You've got quite a lot of variety of, of fishing here from high water marks, low water marks, sandy marks, rough marks, all sorts, completely different variety of, of fishing from one end of the scale to the other. Uh, an example of uh, the sort of benefits of guiding uh, was quite evident earlier. Um, Graham had been given directions uh, to go and fish the beach on the far side of the bay and when I turned up on the on the mark he was about five to six hundred yards further over to the left where it was extremely rocky and extremely snaggy. At, the, at that time he didn't wasn't having a problem but within two hours it would have been an absolute nightmare with tackle losses and everything and like, like Graham said earlier he was quite happy sat there fishing at that present but two hours later it would have been a completely different story and it walked away totally dejected and absolutely had an absolute nightmare. But it wasn't such a nightmare for Cray because yes he's straight up to a fisher that's what fishing guys should be doing catching fish or basically pointing their clients in the direction of catching fish. One thing you must do here is you've got to whine like crazy to get those fish up and over any snags any boulders but Craig did so. Well, look at the succession there. A nice dogfish. Okay, just a dogfish. But listen, I wasn't catching very much at the other mark. At least this is a pointer in the right direction. There could be more to come. Uh, you've just noticed me uh, throw a dogfish back in. You might have thought, well, that was a bit, a bit anti-social, really launching the dogfish out like, like that. Uh, the reason for that, dogfish strange old creatures as they are got when you catch them reel them in quite often when you throw them back their onboard sat nav turns turns around on themselves and they just wash up on the beach um, and quite often under the cover of darkness they go unnoticed and you can turn up in the morning holiday makers or and people locals walk in the dogs tons of dogfish litter on the beach where the poor old dogfish has got confused and washed up on the beach hence the reason why i threw it back out if it had been a bit rougher, I'd have thrown it a little bit further out. They're quite hardy things, and they can, they can handle a sort of triple back somersault straight back into the sea. By now, everybody was trying to get the best out of a bad day. Casting out fresh baits. Well, here's Craig again. Well, he is a fishing guy. Another fish bites the dust. And don't forget, all these are returned as well. So you've got to work at it. You've got to keep fishing. A lot of my clients um, I take guiding uh, are competency anglers. Uh, they, they've got their own gear, they bring along their own baits, they bait up themselves. Um, but don't, don't be put off uh, if, you're on, if you're coming down on holiday and you think, oh, I don't want to make myself look a bit of a, a novice or haven't got a, don't, want to, don't want to be able to feel like you don't know what you're doing. Because um, I'm more than happy to bait up your traces, help you cast out and just get you going. So don't be afraid you know to, to give me a shout or, or to call on a guide um, to help you out to do this because that's what we're here for what I like to do um, if you are a novice angler is to you know, help to, to get help you get going bait up get some baits in the water so we're fishing and then explain to you how how to do it so then you can get to do it yourself uh, then you're learning as well and it, it, a bit more you feel about you've accomplished something uh, but you know, if you if you find it hard, finding it hard to bait up don't don't worry you know, I'm happy to, to take you guiding um, and bait up for you if, if that's an issue.
Well, eventually, yes, even I can get in amongst these fish. Other people seem to be catching them. Why did it take me so long? Here we go, another fine dogfish. Now, they will eat pretty much everything, but on this day in question, they seem to favour either worm and or sand hill combination baits. And it was critical to get out as far as you can. Luckily, instead of the wind being in my face, it was, you know, slightly, slightly off my shoulder. So take yourself a good stance, open the bail arm. Get yourself comfortable. You don't want to twist an ankle on those boulders. Swing the lead back and just let it rip. Out as far as you can get and take Craig's advice, use at least a five ounce lead. You want as much distance as you can. You don't want to be dropping short and letting your lead fall in those snags. wasn't too long before I got in the rhythm of things and mostly with sand eel lashed onto the hook sent out as far as I could the dogfish well they were on the bite big time would have been nice to get a smooth hound but what we found is actually smooth hounds don't really like fish baits in fact I can't even remember catching one on a fish bait generally they love crab that's what they're in there feeding on but dogfish on the other hand do love a fish bait. When I'm gone, but I'll be back someday to keep searching through this misty hay. Once you've cast out, make sure you tighten up to the rod top. You know, you want to get a little bow in the rod top. Make sure everything's clear in the beach rest. You don't want any, any tangles, you don't want any snags. You always want to check that your real drag is set so the top of the tripod doesn't actually, you know, topple over. If you get a big fish, you don't want it topping over the side and disappearing into the water because the other thing that can happen, even if you don't lose the rod and reel, you can actually just let the rest fall over and that way you get sand and grit in the reel and that's the end of that. Fortunately the smooth hounds weren't shown at that time they did have a couple of bites but doggies were there and they're just not big enough to pull those rods out of the rest. They give you a good bite and the main thing is if you think you've got a smooth hound you've got to crank like crazy get that line tight to the fish and then try and power it up and lift it up and away and over the top of any of those snags. Here he is, a man who's caught a nice big smooth hound. In fact, I think this gentleman here, I think was a carp angler, and it's his first smooth hound. So that was well worth turning out for. This is a standard uh, pulley rig, uh, which is quite a common rig on the Bristol Channel. It's, you can use it for a multitude of purposes, and it's one of my favourite rigs. Um, personally, I like to target big fish, uh, and it is definitely a big fish rig. Uh, but it's not the be all and end all, but, but as a general standard, throwing a fish for something decent, this is the, the rig we use. Uh, I've got a, a five and a half ounce Namex lead, um, which is attached to a crimp. Um, and a breakaway in with 60 pound rig body. On the rig body, I have get them here, a bead, a swivel, and a bead. Uh, this is to attach to your line. And then we've got another swivel to attach a hook length. The hook length goes down to a couple of hooks, uh, panel fashion. Uh, and I've got a piece of neoprene rig tube in just to keep it all, all in line. For bait presentation and then to bait this rig up I'm going to use a whole squid and I'm going to show you how I prefer to use a whole squid. I've got a, a squid tube here which I've um, I've stripped the skin I'm going to cut it up here I'm going to stick it on my box you can put it on a stone when I've got the stone I'm just going to give it a good tenderizing turn it over 
bruising it like this releases essential oils which can attract the fish from further afield. I'm going to give it a good old tenderising. You can see it's sort of like pretty mushy, a bit bruised. You know, that's okay, it's fine. Then I use one of these nifty tool, baiting tools, which I'll just nick him on here. Just skewer him on, like so. Slide him down, like that. Bait elastic, seriously essential. And I'm just winding this on there. You can see that, look at this. Juicy, oozy, milky, it's just, just screams fish come and eat me. And the, 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 the response time on a squid fish like this, I'd say it's probably double, triple to just a normal squid. This is up for my, my experience and my, uh, the way I can see that. Once that's nicely tucked onto there, we get the, leave this half out of the way, get this hook here, the one here, slide it in there and turn it round. And then position the hook in that little shepherd's hook type of style thing there. Lay it on here. Pick up the elastic and give it a good old wrapping. The squid's so juicy and squadgy that elastic just goes straight in there and hides and you can't see it, the fish can't feel it. It's just embedded. Now I'll wrap that up, lovely. And then a little half hitch like that just to secure it. Whether, it's, whether you need to do that is another thing, but that's like I like to. And then what I do now is just take the hook out of there and slide it straight off the off there. Job done. Then pull this top panel hook into here, turn it, and then pull the line up tight. And there we go. Well, I decided to stop off there. Was it worth it? It certainly was. An early morning start for me, up about six o'clock in the morning. I climbed down from the St. Albury's Bay holiday camp. Was it worth it? Oh boy, it was always, it's always worth it when you get a fish, isn't it? Well, there we go, guys. Early bird catches the worm. Craig said just to try down this beach on the way out. I was driving home, I thought, I'll get up at 6.30, 7 o'clock. Hit it at the same time as the tide was last night. And there we go, a fish. Yes, it might just be a dogfish to some people, but it's heaven to me. On the way home, that's a bonus fish. Do you know what, am I going home yet? No, that's what Beach Quest is all about. Changing, moving, finding somewhere where the fish are biting. Ow, this one's biting. There he goes. Oh my God, I think there's a nibble on the other one. And they still keep coming, folks. Ladies, I love this place. Just have to go and put that extra time in where you got the hunches or where the guy tells you to go. It's come up with a double shot, a nice dogfish. And these quite big dogfish for the shore. Really pleased with that. Eventually, I will have to go home. But for the moment, 
tide is falling, I might just squeeze one more cast in. That's what it's all about. Well, this is something different now, what I'm doing, because I hooked a fish on what I call my shotgun rod down on the inside, the middle rod, close in. See, like a decent fish. On the way in, I got hung up. So it's very, very tempting, and I've fished it before that I know I'm going to pull for a break. So I thought, do you know what? I haven't cast very far because the wind's killing my distance down. It's stopping me getting right out there. I'll leave it where it is, I'll get it back when the tide goes down. And then, on my long distance rod, on a huge peeler crab that Craig left me, or half a giant peeler crab, I fired out as far as I could. I had what I believe was a really good fish on it, and I'm really annoyed. I got it coming, got it coming, got it coming just locked up solid. Do you know what? It's pretty infuriating because the other day I lost what I think might have been a really big ray. Could have been double figures and I've never had a double figure ray off the shore. So it's a little bit of a, it's personal now. So I'm doing something that I've not done before. I'm going to let the tide go out. If I don't get anything on the close in rod, fine. I'm going to have to pull for a break but I'll probably just lift it out anyway and see what's there. I'm really curious because a lot of times I think fish are hung up and where it's tethered, they can tear against the hook and get away, or they can wear through the line and chafe it, and they still get away. Because you often find terminal gear at the bottom of the beach, especially rough, snaggy ones, and yes, there's no fish on the end of it. It's an interesting exercise. Unfortunately, it's time consuming, and it's going to take me an hour to an hour and a half. I'm determined to sit this one out because I really want to see what's on the end of that line. But you know what, it's almost as exciting as fishing itself. I've been moving the rods down, winding up the slack, moving them down, winding up the slack. I can now see the shot leader. It's so exciting, I can't tell you, it's just out of depth. I just don't want to pull on it, I just hope hopefully there's something there. And hey ho, look, at the end of the day, I don't leave any snag gear out there. I actually hopefully get all my gear back. Another thing is, I want to see what I snagged on, because I, had, I definitely had a fish on the way in there. Come on, tide, hurry up. As the tide dropped down onto the sand, well, I could wind down and actually lift the fish out. It was in amongst a huge bunch of weed. In fact, you'd think it was a bunch of weed, but in fact, it turned into, yes, a fish. Underneath all that lot was indeed the fish that got me snagged. It took me one and a half hours to get that fish back. But more important, not only did I get the fish, I got my tackle back as well. And your dance, you're dancing for me. I feel a connection, a growing attraction. Please, won't you give me your touch? All I need is your touch. Your eyes, your eyes don't lie. It's clear to me you're teasing me. Why? When love. 